Hello and welcome to the Inspiration Sessions. I'm Renee Kaz, I'm your host, and I'm also the founder of The Inspired Women. So that's an online and in-person networking group for dynamic, like-hearted and like-minded business women. So we've got a super active Facebook group. If you're not already a member, make sure you add yourself to the Inspired Women Facebook group. And in the group, we share loads of free business tools and resources. And it's also a really beautiful place to connect and you know, create genuine connections with other business women. So just a little tiny bit about me. So I'm a former lawyer turned business coach and I'm also a public speaker. And my mission in life is to educate, inspire and help transform the lives of women. So helping them to be the best versions of themselves uh, so that, you know, they can make a greater impact within their businesses or their career. And then that also trickles off into every other area of their life. So their home life and everyone else that they're interacting with. And it's my intention to also lead by example and show the limitless possibilities that we all have when we express our greatest potential. So enough about me. This is the second in a series of Q&A style inspiration sessions that I'm running. And again, this is with the intention of inspiring you through sharing stories of ordinary people who have an extraordinarily inspiring story. And I'm glad I was able to get that out without mucking that one up. So in this inspiration session, I'm interviewing Heidi Lee Anderson, AKA The Real Heidi. And Heidi has a degree in public relations, which she used to get her very first real job in PR and marketing in London. She's also managed bars and traveled around the globe. In 2010, Heidi started in radio and these days, you will find her on air on Hit 92.9 alongside Will and Woody, six to 9 a.m. weekday mornings. Very, very committed, obviously, to her career. Uh, Heidi also writes a column for Perth Now and Mamma Mia. And you might have also seen Heidi uh, on TV, either um, you know when she was a contestant on Big Brother in 2013, one of her big claims to fame. And you might have also seen her on, right now she has a segment on Channel 9 in WA every Sunday at um, 10 a.m. on Footy WA. Heidi is also a huge supporter of uh, a range of charities, including AIM, Melanoma WA and Lifeline WA. And last year, she started her own YouTube channel. So if you haven't already, you need to watch, especially the intro video on her channel. Uh, it's absolutely hilarious. And even preparing for today, I watched it again, like for the third time and still laugh every single time, especially the bit about Roger and um, watching Scream 2. Yes, uh, those awkward childhood or adolescent moments. <laughs> <laughs> so Heidi's also launched the website realheidi.com. So that's where she shares with complete honesty and total vulnerability about some really huge topics. And, you know, she really pushes the boundaries with that, um, which obviously she couldn't really get away with on air, on radio. So uh, Heidi also has a podcast on realheidi.com where she dives into some seriously interesting topics. There was a transgender man and woman on there explaining what it was like for them growing up in the wrong body. Um, there's one of Perth's most popular dominatrix who spills all of her secrets. Uh, there's even an episode which is really interesting on, um, you know, a couple of ladies sharing about abortion and how that affected them. Um, Eating disorders, Dr. Kat opening up about living with several eating disorders. So some really interesting stuff on there. And what you probably don't know about Heidi is, yes, she's super bubbly, super confident. And listening to her on air, you'd probably think that, you know, the furthest thing that she's ever affected by is something like anxiety. But this is a huge issue and I see so many women struggling with it. So I wanted to be able to use this inspiration session to help remove the taboo around anxiety and go deep with Heidi about how it's affected her and what she does to stay on top of her A-game. So Heidi, welcome. I love the work you're doing. Oh, God, I sound all right when you say it, like, but yeah, I think you forget that you <laughs> things and like, I'm like, wow, tick box, this person sounds all right. That's you, babe. That's you. You sound all right. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Like, it, it, yeah, I think the work that you're doing is awesome. And speaking about anxiety is something that is really quite important. I don't think I really knew how important it was till the last couple of years as well. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming on. It's great to have you. And I'm sure the ladies are going to love to hear what you've got to share. So um, we'll dive into it. And... 
You know, I think probably most importantly, what the question is probably on everyone's mind is when are we going to get some more snippets from your diary and what happened to Roger? Well, I was going to say, I've been so slack with my YouTube because I've built my website instead and I've been focusing on this podcast. And I think that's the hardest thing when you're working a full-time job in breakfast radio, it is extremely demanding and the hours that you do and the functions that you have to go to and stuff, you get caught up. So I feel really slack that I haven't done any videos lately. Um, I've got one written down to do today, this afternoon, actually, since I did my hair for you. Um, but Roger, what happened with Roger? I, I sh you should have told me I would have bought my diary. It's actually <laughs> horrendous what I used to write when I was 14 and that's true it's all true I think there's one the last episode that I recorded and I haven't posted it yet because I was so nervous is I talk about how I had a dream about Roger and I had sex with him in this dream and I talk about giving him a head job <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to say that but I wrote that in my diary when I was 14 like what the hell that just shows Bathurst nothing not a lot was going on um girls boys and um I think that was about it oh yeah it was really awkward like read, uh, hearing you read it out I was like oh my gosh I still have some of my child or adolescent diaries here and I I can't even read them myself in year 12 we were able to open up this time capsule that we put in yeah. the ground at school when we were year 10 and oh my gosh, the stuff I wrote about this guy that I fancied at the time. And oh, it was so bad. It's so bad. And I thought, do you know what? That diary had written do not open or something on it. And it had sat at my mum and dad's house only until, what, two years ago or something. So until I was 31. So they would have read it. They would have bloody read it. So I just think, oh my God, my mum must think sometimes, oh God, she made it out okay, thankfully. Oh, you have like 20 children or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's jump into it then. So obviously today's session is sort of about sharing your story around anxiety. And like I said before, this is something that I see is a huge topic with women in business. And yeah. I see it holds so many women back because we get caught up in that space and then unable to move forward. But I'd really love to hear a bit about your story about anxiety. I mean, when did you first notice the signs of it coming up um it's funny because now i talk about it i realize i've had it forever um and i had it all through high school and everything but i just i guess i always kind of hit it like when i'm i laugh now and i say to people what the way that i act when i'm drunk which is just 10 times crazy than what i am on the radio like you know going 100 miles an hour that's what i was like when i was drunk that's how i used to go 24 7. And so I think I kind of hid behind that craziness all the time. And I didn't really have time to um, really get in touch with myself, if you know what I mean. Um, and I remember having my first panic attack and not knowing really what it was when um, I'd had a fight with my boyfriend. And I must have been, I must have been 17 or something because I was driving, I had my peas. And I was so worked up and I remember being so... Well, I would look at now as anxiety. Um, I tried to crash my car, like ripped the handbrake on. And there was another time that I drove from Sydney to Bathurst and I was so worked up that like my girlfriend, one of my girlfriends hated me about something like, and I must've been maybe 24 or something at that time. I must know it was when I got back from overseas when it was quite bad. And I remember like, I don't actually really remember driving because I was so erratic. And I remember I got to my best friend and she was like, what is going on? And I'm like, I explained to her what had happened. And she said, I think you're having a panic attack. Um, and I'd had this crazy kind of lifestyle living and working in London, chasing my public relations dream. Um, and I partied pretty hard. And when I say that to people, I'm like, you can take from that what you will. Um, but yeah, party pretty hard in London. And I would party all weekend and then try and work this job in the week. And my boss was something else like she taught me a lot but she was a real bad bully and I think all of that kind of that lifestyle really brought out um this anxious like this anxious Heidi and I pretty much had a broke a breakdown when my mum came to stay and um I remember just bawling my eyes out on the side of a London street crying and cry like uncontrollably not knowing what was going on with me 
By the way, I'd been an absolute bitch to her for the two weeks that she was there because I was really unhappy. Um, and she just kept trying to push through and, you know, all that lifestyle, had, I think, caught up with me a little bit. And then it was in that moment that she was like, just come home. And she got on the plane that day and I ended up staying in London. I think I, I finished like maybe two months there. And that's when I realised I need to go home. Like I'm not doing great. Like I'm unhappy. I'm working for someone who's horrible. I'm ang Well, I didn't know I was anxious. There's something wrong with me. You know, like I was constantly like at this level of, I can't even like living, I guess for people who have anxiety, it's like a, you're in a bubble. And um, anyway, I came home and then they diagnosed me with anxiety and I was supposed to get medicated and all that. And that was in um, 2009. And I kind of just did 10 sessions, um, did some QB, uh, sorry, CBT therapy, cogn cognitive behavioral therapy. And I was like, oh, I'm fixed. And then I kind of went on my merry way in radio. And then I just completely ignored the fact that I had anxiety and all these things used to happen in radio and I put all this pressure on myself and the second guessing and the extreme highs and lows. And um, it wasn't until I had like last, started last year, a massive turn in my career and um, I got a lot of changes at work and stuff and I didn't really get along well with my boss and I was struggling with Will and Woody and, you know, we're from two totally separate uh, worlds and everything just came Crum, like crumpling around me and I just remember I'm not like I was struggling to get to work to be on air but I was going and I was having panic attacks in the middle of the show and um, like I'd run off to the toilets and bawl my eyes out or have to go to the toilet because like if I, I get the runs really bad <laughs> if I'm really really anxious um, and then I was faking it and it was like I was there uh, my body was physically there, but my mind, it was like I was in autopilot. I could do everything, but I was not there. And, you know, I talk to people about it. It's the second voice in your head. And that's pretty much gone now. Um, and my boss, anyway, the one that I wasn't getting along with well, asked me to write down exactly what I was going through. And it wasn't until I opened up on the radio about my anxiety, which I'll share with you that video, um, which is it's pretty raw and real for me still. Um, that I started to heal and started to look after myself. And so I needed to be open. And that was the biggest thing. I think because, you know, real Heidi, being real and open and honest, I was just in complete denial. So I, since then, have done a lot of work on myself and just being open and honest about it. Now the boys get it. Like they understand like my anxious behavior and, um, yeah, there's a lot of symptoms and all that kind of thing that like I look at sometimes that I probably ignore that I'm like, oh, that's rearing its little head a little bit. Um, but I just, yeah, it's, um, it's funny because a lot of people think, oh, how can she be anxious and on the radio? Oh, mate, it's easy. You got to fa you fake it sometimes. Yeah. And so when that was all happening, you sort of said you probably didn't open up about it very much. Was there anyone you were talking to about it or you just completely bought no, it? No, and I guess that's the thing. If you do suffer from anxiety, and there are a lot of us, um, I can't remember what the latest stats were. I thought it was one in two people, but that might be too high. There's an extreme amount of people that have anxiety. Um, my internal battle is so bad and so critical that if I was to talk to someone about it, that would give me 10 times more anxiety because I have like quite bad paranoia with mine. So I used to say, if my boss was talking to my producer over the other side of the room or whatever, I could see them, they were talking about me and the way that I'd been on air that day. And um, if Will and Woody were doing this, like they were talking about me. So um, I'd come home and I, I was just constantly like thought that everyone thought that I was shit and that everyone thought that I wasn't good enough. And that didn't stop. And so I was coming home and I was, I'd be in the shower and I wouldn't be able to get off the floor and I would just cry and cry and cry. And because my partner, Griffo, works FIFO, he, um, he, like when he was home, he would get like, sometimes I'd be real high and happy because, you know, like I might have got through a show without a panic attack or whatever. And like, then we'd come home and drink wine and get really pissed because like that would numb it. And then the next day I would be 10 times worse and he didn't know who he was getting. I think, like I said, though, I was on autopilot. So to be honest, there's about six weeks that were a blur. Yeah. And that's when I realised that 
I had to do something about it. And that's when everything kind of came crashing down with my boss and the big boss made me have a big chat to her. And, you know, she's worked really hard at understanding my anxiety, but it's also been the best thing for me. So as much as it sounds like hell, and I'm sure there might be women and stuff that are going through it right now, there is a silver lining and it is that you can find peace and happiness, which I'm sure you've experienced yourself and, uh, only the last few weeks, there's lots of changes going on with our radio show. Some people might have uh, seen the newspaper article, but the boys are leaving, Will and Woody, to go back to the East Coast. And so that means with an anxious person, and I'm sure you'd feel the same way, like change just scares the shit out of you and all your fear. And, you know, for a normal person, they would have fear. But for someone with anxiety, it's a little bit, you know, and then your ego rears its head up. And, yeah, so it's... The last few weeks, I'm trying to find that balance again, but I've had to take a mental health day the other day and I was so ashamed and embarrassed just to do that. And the next day, I should have come in and been open about that and talked about that on the air, like that I needed to have a day off. But why would people want to hear that? That's what I was thinking, you know? Why would people want to think, oh, she's she's weak? Like she just all she's got to do is come in on the radio and talk, you know? But when I get anxious, I actually can't speak which is quite funny. <laughs> kind of ironic. Yeah. And I think that's really powerful though because that's your career. It's not just yeah. talking obviously, but and you take it very seriously and that's obviously why there's some anxiety around it. But I, and I shared on a post recently on Facebook when I was working in law, I never did actually share with the firm, although I'm sure I could have spoken to the office manager or HR about it. They were both really amazing women, but I would once a quarter around abouts. I just, it just started to build up. Like I loved working where I was. I was at a really good firm. I was very fortunate. Yeah. And I enjoyed going to work each day and I'd be there early or on time. And then I just start to notice it'd be harder to get up out of bed. And then after a bit of time, I just like have this feeling come over me. Like I just don't want to go. I just can't go today. And then I go, well, what if you didn't go? What if you just didn't go today? And I'm like, Oh, and then the feeling of relief. And so I would take and literally be a mental health that I tell some of my girlfriends, yeah. but I'd never tell the firm. And I kind of wish I had opened up about it because then it wouldn't have been taboo. But law is really, is very old school still. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's still such a huge, like there's still so much stigma. And so I'm kind of disappointed in myself that I didn't talk about it because I'm in the position that I could have opened a few more eyes up you know and so that's why I decided to write about it it was a couple of weeks later but that's yeah because I was like and, and the funny thing is when I'm writing a column is if I'm trying to write another one and sometimes one's sitting there and it needs to just be blurted out I can't write anything else and I was actually going to try and promote my bloody podcast and do the latest episode of the podcast which is the transgender guys you were speaking about about Nick and, um, and Cherie but instead I was like what of this mental health day. I was like, I felt like I was lying to everyone. And that's why I have this real um, conflict sometimes with, uh, you know, my job because working in commercial radio, there are certain regulations, you've got to do certain things, but I'm like, I just need to be more open and honest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's really powerful. And it's great that you have got that opportunity to at least touch on some things in that oh, space yeah. so publicly. And being someone who's so open and honest and vulnerable, you probably take it to a much deeper level than what they used to on those shows. And that's the thing. Like, that's what I think sometimes you get disappointed because it's like we have this opportunity to, yes, like to entertain. And obviously you wouldn't do that stuff all the time. But I feel like it is a really important thing. And that, I guess, that's the difference between um, myself and the boys that I work with. Like they're awesome and they do great things on the, on the radio and they're bloody funny guys, but um, they want to make radio. That's just like a bit stunty and you know what I mean? Like, and that's so awesome, but I want to do more of this real shit. So <laughs> <laughs> real and like, I want people to feel and I want people to laugh. I like, I want people to really like heal as well and like cry and, um, you know, be able to feel all these emotions, not just laughter, because that's the real world, you know? And that's how Les Brown started out. He was on radio and then he went into politics. Yeah. And then became, you know, an international world famous speaker and motivates millions of people even today and he's in his 70s. Yeah, well, I definitely don't think I'll be getting into politics anytime soon. My brother, on the other hand, he probably will. I'll leave that to him. 
Um, so yeah, and I, I really enjoyed reading that Perth Now article actually that you had that you'd shared with um, about the mental health day. So was that you were you sharing that because well it sounds like it was just so important for you, you couldn't not. Yeah, exactly. Like like I said, it just felt like I had to just get it off my chest. Like because genuinely that day, and I wrote about it in the article, I did go into work. And it was so hard. I'd been up most of the night. It had been a year since my nan had passed away, who was one of, you know, my greatest friends, you could say. And I was struggling with that. A lot of shit was going on behind the scene at work. Like there's a lot of changes, but also like there's a lot of emotion and stuff that is put into a radio show. And I think people and passion and, um, and people forget that, you know what I mean? So I went in that day going like, I can't let people down. Like, do you know what I mean? All these people depend on me and, um, and you know, and they really don't. It's one show for God's sake, but that's the pressure that I put myself under constantly every single day. And I went in there and I literally could barely speak. And they sent me home two minutes before the mics were on. I burst into tears and I couldn't speak. And I was just a mess. And like I said, I felt that day that I'd let heaps of people down and I, um, yeah, which, I mean, I'm reading this subtle art of not giving a fuck, but that's not helping. I, I think I'm getting there slowly, um, but I'm trying to get better at not worrying about what people think or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, like I said, I just had to get it out. And I also felt like, God, if I'm bloody stressed about this, then other people must be as well. So, and I think that's the power that I've realized through sharing my anxiety story, through sharing my body image story uh, when I was living and working in Bunbury on the radio there. I realized the power of connection with people and what by me telling my story, yeah, it might be hard and yeah, maybe I haven't fully dealt with it yet either, but I am helping other people and I feel. Like, I don't know if you believe in all that stuff, but maybe that I was put on this earth to um, to help people. And I think when I first got into radio, I thought I was just going to probably do the same radio that Will and Woody wanted to do and just make people laugh. But now I realise that it's so much more than that. Like, I want to do a radio show that connects with people every single day and makes people feel something so that they can better their lives, you know? I love that. That is so powerful. And you can feel it. You can feel the energy from you when you're talking about that. That's yeah, super yeah. exciting. And you do have that power, particularly being on the radio. And when you do talk about something like that and opening up about anxiety, I think you know when we're vulnerable and open and honest, it allows other people to open up and be vulnerable too. And think about you know, the amount of conversations that would happen afterwards or during that and go, you know, on both sides and people actually just going, wow, I didn't, I didn't even realize that that's how people felt. Or so many people saying, wow, I'm so happy. I'm not the only one that feels that way. I'm not crazy. Yeah. It's actually okay. And there's something I can do. So you said earlier that you, when it all became really bad, that you started to do a whole lot of work on yourself that yeah. helped you. So what kinds of things have you found have helped you with your anxiety and dealing oh. with it? So I reckon the biggest first thing that I say to anyone is just being open about it because like, you know, that stuff that you're going through in there is 10 times worse on your own than just sometimes blurting it out and someone just giving you a reality check and being like, it's not actually that bad. Like, you know, you're you're stressing about this or saying like, you know, if you're worried about the person not calling, texting you back or whatever, because sometimes we do, oh my God, what have I done wrong? Oh, you know, this, that, right. Just bloody ring them. Like I just can try and confront things more. And, um, and that's one thing that I've made a promise to myself because although I'm so open and honest outside of work, I don't, I'm not open and honest enough, I think with my colleagues for them to really know, because I'm a people pleaser and I don't know whether that uh, is an anxious trait as well but like I just constantly want people to like me um which is really quite sad you know because it's like you should just be happy with yourself but I feel like I'm always looking for this reassurance of other people um but I've done all different things the best thing for me was I found the psychologists at master's psychology uh have been absolutely amazing and Jan is by far the greatest psychologist I've ever had um, and I've done this therapy called eye movement restorative desensitization something. It's EMDR 
I, I always get it mixed up. But it's like this crazy stuff that they do a lot of with people that have suffered from post-traumatic stress. Um, but it helped a lot of people with anxiety. So I do that with her. Also have good chats with her as well. And she offers me some great tools. Um, recently, I've just started at the Brain and Wellness Spa, which is, I was saying this to you, Renee, before we started recording, it's the weirdest thing. You go into a room and it's, it is kind of like you're going to a spa, you know, that you get a facial, but you're going for your brain. And look, some people don't approve of it and it has worked for a lot of the people if you read their reviews and stuff, but it might not work for everyone. So you put these headphones on and you lay there on these big comfy chairs and they play this music to you while they talk to you while you're under listening to this music and they talk through this code or whatever. Anyway, apparently it hits your subconscious, which is where a lot of our anxiety and stuff is and only 20% or something of your anxiety is when you're conscious the rest of it comes to you or whatever in the subconscious. I probably don't do nearly a good job as explaining it as they do. Um, so I've tried that and it's really helped. It's helped me a lot. And they kind of, um, we've chatted a lot about my self-esteem and stuff, which I don't really have a lot of, uh, which is funnily funny because people are like, how can you be on the radio? But um, it's definitely become a, a thing of why I want to help people, I guess, and inspire and stuff. Um, I meditate now when I remember, which I've been going to a really cool little place called Exhale Mindfulness. So I try and go there and do a guided meditation, but I also do heaps on my laptop and stuff. But like I said, I can be a bit slack with that one. Um, I go to yoga, yin yoga when I can. My best friend owns a studio there. I shouldn't drink as much, but lately I've been drinking a lot. Um, yeah, exercise. Exercise is a big one for me. Um, but yeah, I was told that I probably should be medicated, that mine was chemical imbalance. Um, but I chose not to. And that's nothing against anyone who wants to be on medication. My best friend is on medication. My mum has just come off her medication. Um, and I just felt like in the job that I'm in, I need a little bit of crazy. And... <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I heard that it also like doesn't do wonders for your sex drive. And I was like, well, my man's only home every eight days. So I'm going to need a sex drive. <laughs> so, and I felt like through doing all this work myself, I've kind of, I've really experienced, I've become so self-aware. I've read, I read a lot of self-help books. Like they're not for everyone either, but I really enjoy them. Um, and yeah, like I've done body confidence courses and that kind of thing. Look, I try everything. Yeah, that's really cool. Have you no like, okay, all of this is really cool. And I think a lot of these things actually, and the more I'm hearing your story, the more I'm realizing, cause I know I, I've definitely suffered from anxiety at times. Yeah. There are things that I heard you say and I was like, dang, I do that a lot still. Like the other week I ran one of the biggest events for our group that we've ever had. We had 70 people there and I didn't even celebrate it for myself. And at the time and afterwards I was berating myself and I was like, this wasn't good enough. That yeah. wasn't good enough. And all these things and it just wasn't fun. And I thought about say, Renee, you've created this to bring people together and you love it and you're getting amazing feedback. Why don't you just enjoy it? And I was like, oh yeah. Okay. Well, how would you, what would you need to do differently? Yeah. And I was like, okay, if I'd done this the day before, if I'd done that the day before, if I'd done these certain things, then I would have enjoyed it more. So I've made changes to my behavior, but I'm definitely hearing it. Like it just, it sounds like you're super hard on yourself. Oh all my the time. God, so hard on myself. And it was funny. I think you messaged me the other day and I was like, oh, I'm going through this stuff at the moment. And I sat here on this couch here only last week. I think I poured myself a glass of wine at like two o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, which is okay because I get up at four, right? Yeah, um, it's like basically six o'clock then. Exactly. And I sat here and I cried to Griffo, my partner, and was just like, I am, because he, he was saying, you are so hard on yourself. He's like, I've never met anyone who isn't just celebrating all these little wins and all the things that you do. And I was saying to him, um, oh my God, like I don't, I, like I need assurance by how many people listen to my podcast. I need assurance by how many people have liked this video. I need assurance by how many people have commented. I need assurance by my boss. Be enough though, would it? Yeah. 
like you need 10,000, then you need 10,000, then 10,000, you need 20,000. Yeah. They never and know. Like, and I've built this tiny little community exactly like what you have done. And we're not celebrating it and we're not living in the moment. And even me sitting here today, like the fact that you want to interview me and stuff, I won't walk away and be like, fuck yeah, that is awesome. Like, We've just spoke to how many ever women and, and this, I am going to walk away and go, oh, should I have said that? Oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Oh, you know, or, or I've got to go to my list now and do the million things that I've got to do. You know, <laughs> it's, it's shit, isn't it? And it's like, we need to start being better to ourselves. And I think um, that's something definitely that I, I need to work on as well. And I think that comes down to your self-worth and your self-value and, just being like, hey, shit, I did a good job today. Like, but we just get so caught up in it. And I think that's being a high achiever as well, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I love those tips that you gave as well. So I just want to recap those in case anyone's taking notes. Um, and too, because I waffle as well. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Confronting the issue head on, so not letting things fester. Um, being open, so sharing with people, with friends, with family, where you're at, what's going on. Um, you're speaking to a psychologist. So you said before you did cognitive behavioral therapy and now EMDR as well. So yeah, I think that's how you say it. Go on. Um, but double check that one. You might need to Google it. <laughs> or EDM. One of the, the things that starts with E. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Brain and Wellness Spa, which that sounds amazing. A few years ago at Conscious Living Expo, I did something like that. You just lay down and they put this machine on and it was just like you went in this deep meditation and I don't know what happened. I came out and was like a different person. Yeah, same. And I honestly, the first time I walked away, I've never been so present. I was driving home like, oh my God, look at the birds. Look at that beautiful, like blue sky. Oh, look at that little old man. Hi. You know, <laughs> yeah, going, I've got to go home and record this podcast. I've got to think about this guest. And rah, rah, rah. I was literally in the moment and I am definitely more. And I think, um, you'll probably say what I also said, meditation as well, that just leaving my guided meditation yesterday, I was like, damn, I need to do this every single day. I probably won't, but, uh, you know, yeah, you should definitely at least do it a couple of times a week. Oh, meditation for me is a game changer. And that's something that I commit to doing every single day. Even if I'm running really late every morning, first thing I do, I sit up in bed and I'll close my eyes. and I'll think about all the things I'm grateful for. Sometimes it's just like, you know, my, amazing comfortable bed but you know like thinking of like 10 different things I'm really grateful for and then I meditate and even if it's just for five minutes you know there's nothing you can't be five minutes late for anyway really yeah, exactly <laughs> so but you know stuff them exactly but that has been a game changer for me doing yeah. that and then I do visualization I do two different meditations one's just sort of focusing on my breath and then the second one's like a heart opening one so yeah. that makes me softer and more loving and yeah. No, because the thing is, and if you believe in all this woo-woo stuff as well, you're probably, and all these women that obviously are a part of this group, we're probably so much in our masculine because we're all so driven and this and that and we've got to get this. And um, it was amazing when someone pointed that out to me and I'm like, wow, I actually noticed that because my partner is much more in his feminine sometimes. We're not, God, he'll kill me for saying that. Hopefully he'll never, ever see this because <laughs> I'm so in my masculine. It pushes the men out. They've got nowhere else to go but to go into the feminine. Yeah. 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 I know, poor men, we emasculate them. Oh, well. No. <laughs> but, yeah, I love meditation and yoga. Yoga is so important. And my mum's a yoga teacher, so mm -hmm. I'm meant to go twice a week. I went this morning, which was good. So twice a week should be good. Um, and exercise, so no alcohol. Actually, that's something I used to notice. I used to really, I would turn to alcohol, to wine when I was feeling strong emotions. But then earlier this year, I gave up alcohol. I used and to up. Yeah, I gave that up. And like I've had a glass here. And I think I've had, I've had one glass actually, one glass of champagne in July. And I stopped drinking on the 22nd of January. And... I just, now I just don't want it, but I noticed I was like, I've got no addictions anymore. Like, okay, I have chocolate. Yes, I'll do chocolate. But I'm like, there's, when I feel things out, I have to really feel it. And that's tough at times. You go into that and you're like, okay, that's all right. This is just going to come up. Whereas my natural reaction when I feel those things would be like, glass of wine would be really good right now. 
oh my gosh, yeah, I drank, this is so bad um, and don't do this or do whatever makes you feel better. But just as long as you are aware of it, I drank a bowl of red wine for lunch on Sunday. <laughs> it's true folk because like we just we found our wedding venue and then it was like all this wedding chat about guests and like I said lots of shit happening at work and stuff and then we were like oh well if we don't eat bad food with it we'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> wines but it is true I definitely need to cut back I do feel much more clearer when I'm not drinking so much but I don't think I could ever fully give it up I think I'm addicted it's something that evolved for me and I never would have thought that would have happened. It's just like, and it wasn't like anything happened. It wasn't like I was hung over and said, I'm never drinking again. I just was like, no, nah, I think I just won't drink alcohol. And then I just haven't. And I've been really, and cause I haven't for so long. I'm like, I've got two bottles of really nice champagne in the fridge that yeah. I haven't even cracked. And I'm like, I really want to have those, but I don't, but I'm like, but I do, I'm not going to waste them. No, isn't it? It's, but I just, I just ordered a couple of books about alcohol, actually, to read. Um, there's one called, like, The Happier Hour and A Control on You or something like that. They've just arrived in the post today. So who knows? The next time you speak to me, I might be alcohol-free. Doubt it. See, I'm single and it makes meeting people really tough. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask that because I've got a girlfriend who she doesn't drink heaps of alcohol now. Um, but yeah, her going out, like she's, cause she's very similar to you kind of just might have one here or there now, but yeah, it, may, it makes it hard, doesn't it? Cause it's our culture. And the boys don't like it. They're like, you don't drink. Oh, I don't know if that's going to work. And you're like, yeah, but that's the thing, isn't it? That's sad, isn't it? Like my boy, oh, my boyfriend, my fiance, um, is exactly the same. And he, I, he's one of the reasons I think I'd probably would have given up for good, but he's a bad influence. Well, that's the thing. That's the thing is, you know, who you're at. But you can still have the, the time while he's away. Yeah. Well, that's what I do. He left this morning and I'm already like, right, no alcohol till next Thursday when he gets home. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. So is there anything else that you would suggest or, or even like something you would have done differently, like knowing what you know now? What would you have done differently when you first noticed things or what's your language to yourself when you notice anxiety coming up? Is there something that you do differently? Um, I think it was, like I said, more than anything was to be open and real about what's going on. And I know that I still need to, to do better at that myself. Um, but it, honestly, being vulnerable, like I say to my girlfriends, because I've got two girlfriends who find it so hard to be vulnerable, is the most beautiful thing and it is the most tough thing to do all in one. Um, but if you can truly be honest, and I know there are people who are, oh, people think I'm weak and I can't tell my boss this and all that, like then maybe you're in the wrong place of work. Do you know what I mean? Like be, being open and honest about it has definitely been the best thing for me and it has helped me heal so much because then I've surrounded myself with the right people. I've met amazing people along the way. Whereas I think when you, when you won't talk about it, you're alone and you 100% are alone yeah. and you think that no one will get it and no one will understand. And I think just even if you haven't ever spoke to your girlfriend about it, like just start like paving the way to be a little bit more open and honest and, and real, like when shit's hitting the fan or because it, your anxiety is going to make it 10 times worse. Yeah. So yeah, that would be, that would be my thing. And, you know, message me, uh, email me, like talk to me. I've got heaps of people on my website that share their stories and stuff. You can share it anon anonymously, but like it might even be that you just need to write about it. Like writing is so therapeutic and I definitely, I look at this to me, I'm like, preach, preach, preach. I need to preach to myself sometimes. Like <laughs> I need to write more. I need to get a diary and write stuff every day because when I do like push the crap out that is going on I feel 10 times better yeah when you practice what you preach things go pretty well they go a lot yeah. better I know isn't it we're so wise when we tell our friends and our family members or listeners things and then sometimes you're like damn why am I listening to myself you know exactly oh okay well that's really powerful I love that and I totally agree with what you said about opening up with people and if we don't give them an opportunity if we don't actually share things then we don't know how they're going to act and that's something that I've definitely noticed and I have I'm I can be quite a close book with people and 
I'll have an excuse in my head why I can't share that. Oh no, because he'll never understand or she'll never, you know, she just won't get it. Yeah. I never have given them an opportunity to actually understand. And often when I found when I actually do talk to people about things, when I do share how I'm feeling, that really they do tend to get it and it's not. Yeah. Oh my God, exactly. And if they don't, I think it's really nice to be able to educate people. And I look at Griffo now compared to a year or two ago and what he says is so wise and compared to, you know, he didn't get it uh, like 18 months ago or whatever because he's now educated himself. He went and saw a counsellor to talk to his counsellor about how he can help me. Because the funny thing is when you're at quite an anxious person, you'll usually give that anxious energy to that person. Yeah. And he was feeling these anxious energy that he'd never experienced before. So he needed to speak that out with someone. But like, it's like I've said to him as well, when he didn't understand his mate's depression, I was like, Google it. Like, see what you can do to support people. So if you are someone who maybe doesn't experience anxiety, but you know someone that does, find out more about it, you know, by, by asking them questions, by talking about it, by Googling it, by educating yourself. That's a big thing that I reckon really, really helps. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. I, I totally agree. Totally yeah. agree. Um, so how can our listeners and viewers today, how can everyone get in touch with you? Oh, you can always send me an email, which is Heidi at realheidi.com, I think. Oh, God. Anyway, the website, realheidi.com, or you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, um, Twitter, which is Real Heidi as well. But like I said, I'm always happy to share people's stories or hear from people. And um, yeah, I just, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why I'm here on, on this earth, but I think it's got something to do with being able to chat to people and connect to people and uh, like if you don't even want to talk to your mate and you just want to send me a message happy to listen that's really powerful thank you so much and thank you for your time today really appreciate it Heidi thank you keep doing all the awesome work